Well, all right. Um, here we go. This is going to be fun. Joe Rogan, a stand-up comedian. For more than 20 years, Joe Rogan has sold out theaters internationally, with London's Guardian newspaper praising him as one of the most complex and exciting stand-ups working in America today. That is high praise. His fourth hour-long special, Joe Rogan, Rocky Mountain High, premiered on the, uh, on Comedy Central November 21, 2014, and you may get it as a digital video or audio download. He is host of the Joe Rogan Experience, featuring long-form conversation, God bless him for that, with guests that is one of the most popular podcasts online. Since 2002... He has provided color commentary for the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, I'll have questions about that on pay-per-view, Spike Television, and now on Fox. So coming up in just um, a moment, somebody I know you're waiting for, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. Thank you for having me on, sir. It's a huge honor. No, it's my honor. I've been a fan of yours. I guess uh, we spoke briefly before the show, and well, I guess we've been fans of each other for a while. Hmm? Yeah, well, when I used to drive home from the comedy store late at night, you kept me company many, many, many a night. I've been a huge, huge fan of your show and you for a long time. So for me, this is uh, just a huge treat. Well, thank you. Um all right, so you uh, you did a big show, Fear Factor. You did it for a long time. I think there were six seasons of it, right? Yeah. Um, and now you're doing a podcast. I was on uh, national radio everywhere. Now I'm doing a podcast. Pretty cool. Uh, well, it's a beautiful time for, for broadcasting in that sense that anybody can put something out online. You don't have to have a network. You don't have to have uh, anything other than an internet connection and uh, some place that's willing to host it. I mean, it's uh, really incredible times. And because of that, I think we're getting like really diverse shows. You're getting all these different people that, like myself that probably would have never done an actual radio show who are enjoying the freedom that the internet provides. I agree, Joe. Where do you think this means broadcasting is going? I mean, there's these giant radio networks, even television. I think uh, AT&T just ate DirecTV, and now you can see all DirecTV on AT&T. Wow. Well, I think the the really big networks, what they're good for is high-budget things like Game of Thrones or something along those lines that requires millions of dollars in special effects. But for something like what you do or something like what I do, all you really need is a, a couple of tech people to run things mm-hmm. and get things online, and that's it. You don't need giant networks. You don't need interference, producers, people that are running things that I'm sure you don't care about, like demographics and all that jazz. Yes, sir. All that unnecessary stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's better. I think it's better this way. I agree. All right. I, I've got to ask a little bit about Fear Factor because I was like a total fan. In fact, uh, here's a question for you. Um, I was used to seeing it every week, and then suddenly there were some weird splits where Fear Factor wouldn't be on for a long time, and then there'd be an episode and it wouldn't be on again for a long time. Do you remember that? I sort of, I don't know what that was about. It was probably just they had saved a few episodes. And, you know, they do weird stuff with ratings. Ratings, you know, they're always trying to manipulate things during sweeps. And I I never really understood how that all all that stuff works. What was it like, you know, um, everybody was going to want me to ask this, for you to watch these poor people facing, you know, like Central American uh, biting, scratching, eating, furry, gushy things, uh, carrying them with their mouth and then drinking a blender full of them or something like that. How was, how was that? It was as bizarre for me being there, being the host of it, as it was for anybody to watch it. 90% of the time I would show up at work and I just, I, I'd be just shaking my head going, I can't believe this is a real show. It was very, very strange. As a matter of fact, the reason why I was willing to do it in the first place was because I was convinced that it was going to be something that was only on the air for a couple episodes, and then I would have material to make fun of. I just thought it was something completely ridiculous. I'm like, there's no way this is going to stay on television. And then 148 episodes later. Yeah, that's right. Um, Which brings me to this. Uh, With those kinds of shows, you kind of have to keep topping yourself a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, did it get to the point where you wondered if people would live through the next episode? 
Well, it didn't the first time around, but the second time around, we did it again for seven more episodes, I think it was, in 2011, I believe it was. Right. And then I was worried, because there were some episodes that we did where they really kept upping the ante further and further, and there was a few accidents where nobody got hurt, not, nothing serious, but it was like, wow, this is this is more risky than we ever did before, and I always felt like we got lucky the first time around, especially... Uh. There was a few stunts like they they had to ride bulls, and uh, I'm like that is just a risk. You're just rolling the dice. Oh yeah, and anything can happen when you have a bull involved. As we've seen, um, I don't know if you paid attention to the running of the bulls. It's the one of the deadliest years ever. They eleven people were killed in the running of the bulls this year. Yeah, I know, but I, I think that's sort of the earth evening things out. These people don't belong running in front of bulls anyway. I'm with you 100%. Kind of kind of a cleansing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, now you have this podcast, and oh, I've heard that you do some paranormal occasionally. You do sort of everything, right? Yeah, well, I've done quite a bit of paranormal, and I, I did quite a bit on the... I did a sci-fi show called Joe Rogan Questions Everything, right. uh, where I you know, met with a lot of people that were UFO fanatics and Bigfoot people and a lot of strange stuff. And one, one of the things that I found that I found very unfortunate, because I've been a huge fan of just... Uh, I just love the idea of UFOs, even if it's not real. love the idea of Bigfoot. I love... I love the possibility of uncovering some massive mystery like that, of human beings uncovering something like that. Yeah, of course. But, but what I found doing the show that I didn't like was that there was a lot of, uh, what I was dealing with more than actual facts was psychology. And you, you, you get into the psychology of people that believe in things that don't necessarily make sense, where they're not looking at it objectively. Instead, they're like choosing to only, only look at certain information or only look at certain data and don't look at anything that conflicts with that. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. It's, sure it's, it's a problem. It is a problem in ufology and, and all over the paranormal. But still, I'm one of those people who I want to believe there is something more. There has to be something more. I think. And, well, I definitely uh, want to. And if there isn't something more, then I guess we won't care. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, wanting to believe is uh, critical. I mean, it's like, of course. Who wouldn't want a UFO to fly right over the White House lawn and everyone to watch it on television? I think it would be a, a huge, a unique bonding experience for mankind if we really, really were visited. It's like that famous Ronald Reagan speech during the Cold War, sure. how quickly we would abandon our differences with the Soviet Union if we were faced with a threat from another world. And, and we would, would, too. Oh, immediately. Right, right away, it would put it would snap things into perspective. You know, I think the, uh, the idea of this whole entire planet as being one community would really come into focus if we really experience something from another planet, a life form, a super intelligent life form, especially if we felt threatened by them. Well, we are a warrior-like people, and I speak of Americans when I say that, um, and I suppose as a world, we're a warrior-like people, so it figures we'd have to have a war to bring us together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a lot of ways, that's unfortunate, but true. All right, um, I, I, do you do politics on your show at all? Well, I do a little, but you know, quite honestly, uh, the game is so rigged. It's it's such a hustle. Well, it, it normally is. And the, and the only thing I want to ask you is your view, your view on Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like people that stir things up. I loved Ross Perot back when he was running for president because there was a guy that had a ton of money and really didn't need the establishment anymore. And I think there's, in some ways, you get that with Trump. And you get, you get a guy who's going to be brutally honest about things. But you also get a guy talking about Mexicans being rapists and oh, yeah. a lot of crazy stuff that people are like, well, he's, he's in many ways like a lot of really wealthy, successful people. He's a buffoon because he's this guy with this tremendous ego because he's accomplished so much. And one of the ways he's accomplished it is by having this sort of bulldog determination and plow through no matter what. And that leads him to think that he can be the king of the world. And that's where he's at right now, pushing forward and trying to become president. And he's ahead in all the polls by yeah, like, a large margin. Right, like over double, I think. 
<laughs> the next guy. So yeah, oh, it's early. It's an early game, and we all know that sometimes it's not. It's like running a marathon. You know, you see a guy sprint right out the gate, running full blast. Sure. Like, well, how long can that guy keep that up? Yeah. Most of the time, they can't. That's right. All right, let's switch completely subjects because. I'm really interested in this one. Okay. You apparently have had experiences. You, did you did you know Terrence McKenna? I didn't know Terrence, but I do know his brother Dennis. I've had his brother Dennis on my show a few times, but I was hugely influenced by uh, Terrence's uh, appearances on your show. In fact, right? Um, there's some MP3s floating around of uh, him live from Hawaii, from the Big Island, on a broadband spectrum radio signal. That's right. Fascinating, fascinating podcast from, or excuse me, radio show from back in the day. And uh, I've listened to it many times. What an amazing man he was. And I, too, have, uh, well, of course, I interviewed Terrence, and then I, I'm going to interview Dennis again. I've, I've done it before. So um, I guess the big question is uh, your experience, if any, with DMT. Uh, I've had quite a few, and in fact, I have a DMT tattoo on my left arm because of one of them that I had was so profound that I just felt the need to mark it on my body because it was such an insane experience. That Um, profound. Okay, can you actually explain that experience? It's very difficult to explain because it's one, the, the, the idea of DMT, when, when you hear about it from someone who's never experienced it, or rather when you try to explain it to someone who's never experienced it, it sounds like you're seeing some things that aren't there. Oh, well, you're into hallucinating. You're into escape from reality. When you get into the reality of what the, the drug is, it's a human neurotransmitter that exists in your own body. Your, your lungs make it, your liver makes it, your mm-hmm. brain makes it, right. the pineal gland creates it, and it's the most intense psychedelic drug known to man. And what's even more bizarre, and I'm sure you know this, but maybe some people listening don't, it's in thousands of different plants. It's, it's, it's all over the world. It's in almost every ecosystem ever observed. And they don't know why. They, they're really, it's a very bizarre and mysterious psychedelic drug that is also a massive part of the world that we live in and when you take it you experience something that knows everything or at least appears to they communicate with you in some sort of strange language there's a lot of repeated themes there's uh there's telepathic communication there's some sort of way of expressing to you truth in some undeniable form but with love and beauty and in impossible geometric patterns that are just fractal and floating through the air all around you it's it feels like what it feels like is you in the presence of a higher power it feels like what i would imagine it would be to make contact with some sort of a divine entity and i think that when you look at all these different UFO abduction experiences that people have had uh, mm. that take place in the middle of the night where you're in heavy REM sleep, where many people believe the endogenous dumps of DMT are going on through the brain. Many people believe that it's responsible for dreaming. And I say believe because there's a lot of good work being done right now on this by uh, Dr. Rick Strassman, his Cottonwood Research Foundation. And you can learn a lot more about the technical aspects of it from guys like him and from Dennis McKenna. But it, what it feels like when you're there is like you're communicating with God. And that's really what it feels like. All right. For a lot of the audience that doesn't know, um, there are other hallucinogens, of course. For example, LSD, which was a very different and long experience, um, and uh, mushrooms and so forth. But DMT is kind of in a different class, isn't it? it, it, it it's rather short. In duration? Yeah, yeah, very, very short. The, the, when you're smoking it, which is the way most people get it, uh, it lasts about 15 minutes. And uh, it's in it, it's one of the reasons they call it the businessman's high. Well, but it's really odd that they call it that because it's one, the last thing you'd want to do after you do it is do any kind of business. <laughs> Right, but it's uh, extremely transient. Your your body gets rid of it and brings you back to baseline inside of fifteen twenty minutes. Any danger? Uh, I think any time you're dealing with something so mind bogglingly extraordinary, there's the possibility that people with weak hearts, people that uh, don't have uh, the steadiest nerves, or perhaps maybe the, the they don't have the best grip on reality. I think anybody that has real psychological problems should probably avoid psychedelic drugs until they've reached some form of stability in their life. Anyway, have you ever had a flashback? 
I've never had a flashback to like where I fully went into it, right. but I've gotten like to the door and peeked in, <laughs> and it's uh, it's disturbing. It's it disturbing is, it is. It's so readily available. It yeah. is, especially at dinner, you know, with several people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just gives you that little nervous thing. Does anybody know what just happened to me? And but uh, really, it seems to be the flashbacks that a lot of people have. They have when they're dreaming. Um, many people who have done it, I've. I've uh, only had, uh, like I said, like a peek through the door, but many people who have done DMT have had dreams where they smoke it and then fully immersed into the DMT realm again. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, you said you felt like you were in touch with a higher power. Um, I, the high power? I mean, do you, do you think that, um, I don't know, God is a word we throw around, but, uh, you know, is that what you're talking about? Well, it would be pretty arrogant if I assumed it was the higher power because I think being a lower thing like like humans, I mean, obviously the highest that we know of, but we can conceive of something eventually being more evolved, more grand, bigger than us. And I think whatever this is, it's that. If it's the, uh, is it the higher? Well, it's very possible that this experience is merely the tip of the iceberg, and there's something below that that's even more mind-boggling, even more profound. It doesn't. While you're doing it, it feels so titanically alien that nothing could be any crazier. But I think that could very well just be a perception issue, um, a reference issue, the fact that we don't really have a lot of experiences to compare it to that are that crazy. But it could just be the beginning. And that's one of the things that a lot of people who get heavily into psychedelics, and Terrence uh, talked about this quite a bit, that, that they always want to see further. They always right. want to go deeper. Because they always have this feeling that there's something, like you take five grams, you want to try seven. You huh. take seven, you want to try ten. And you want to go deeper and deeper into the world of mushrooms or the world of DMT or ayahuasca or any, any of the, the known psychedelics. I think that's one of the things that happens to people that are frequent travelers, is they want this experience, they want to, they, they feel like maybe there's more to it, that even as crazy and as bizarre and alien and strange and awe-inspiring as it is, it may just be the beginning of this infinite spectrum of possibility. Would you say that your experience with DMT has changed your, your day-to-day life in any way? Yeah, I think it's changed me. I think, um, I think, I think what we are is how we've interpreted uh, how we've interpreted all of, our, all of our experiences, how we've interpreted our, our interactions with people, our time on this planet. When something comes along that just throws a monkey wrench into the gears and shows you something that not only did you never imagine, but feels like you could never have possibly imagined without this experience, that now your point of reference has changed dramatically. Now, instead of having this small spectrum of, of possibilities, you have this possibility that's so far out to the left or to the right that you, you can't see the end of it. And you never thought that was possible until you have that experience. And I think that profoundly changes you as a person. Mm-hmm. Because we are really just an accumulation of our experiences, our interpretations of those experiences and what we've, you know, how we've learned from them and how we apply them to our lives. And the times that I've done DMT, I've always walked out of it feeling like there at least has the potential from this for me to be a better person. Mm-hmm. You said that you heard different languages from, I guess, entities or whatever. Did you actually see something and, and could you detect that it was a human language or non-human? Well, the language seems to be, you, you, you seem to hear it telepathically more than anything. And there's a oh. lot of, like, repeating themes. Like, you hear, um, uh, the, there's a lot of people say, you hear, look at this. I've heard that. I've heard it. And I've heard a lot of other people say the same thing. They show you different, insane things. I remember one time I uh, did it, I was, I was literally crying because they kept saying, look at this. And they would show me something insanely beautiful. And then it was like, like a, I have little kids. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. And one of the things that my five-year-old says, she'll say things that, that are they're really cute and adorable. Like, I love you a million, five hundred thousand, million, <laughs> five hundred thousand, billion, zillion, infinity, times right. a million times. They, right. You know, numbers that aren't real. Well, they, that happened in my DMT experience. The, one of the first ones I ever did. They would sing a little song like, I love you, 600 million, 500 thousand, 500 million times. <laughs> And then it would go, look at this. And then every really? time it would go, look at this, it would show you something infinitely more beautiful than what you just saw. And then it would keep going on and on and on until tears were like rolling down my face. 
Um, <laughs> I think a lot of that it's it's a sound. I mean, you you you're, you're understanding what they're saying. You're understanding words, but I'm not exactly sure you're hearing it more than you're you're hearing it in your mind. And it's one of the reasons why I connect it to the UFO abduction experience because one of the things that you hear from these people that have been that have had these classic UFO abduction scenarios is telepathic communication where there's words in their mind and they're not exactly sure if they're hearing them or if if they're being transmitted somehow directly to their consciousness and that it kind of feels like that when you're doing dmt wow um is there any advice that you would give as a big listening audience out there and they're listening going dmt hmm, is this something i want to try only you can answer that. I really think that it's a, that's a personal thing. And, and I, you know, I've told people they should do it before, but it's probably irresponsible of me. Really, I think everybody's got their own psychological makeup and everybody's got their own, their own path in this life. And if it's something that you're compelled to try, there's a lot of people that believe, and I've heard this from many people that have done it, that DMT finds you. You don't find DMT. You might go looking for it, but really it finds you and decides whether or not you should do it. I, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. And it sounds like an adorable thing to say. You know, it sounds cute, like <laughs> profound, some sort of strange way. Is it really but, separate from ayahuasca from anything else? Is DMT unto itself one thing? That's a good question that someone else should probably answer. Dennis would probably be better at that because I've never done ayahuasca. I've only done the, the, the condensed version of it. What I, the difference for folks at home that are listening that don't know, ayahuasca is like a slow-release DMT, and it was created by the indigenous Amazon people because they don't have chemistry labs. They can't synthesize DMT. They can't uh, extract it from these plants the, the, way chemical, uh, the way they do it in labs. So what they do is they use the root of one plant and the leaves of another plant. So one plant contains the DMT and the other contains an MAO inhibitor, a natural MAO inhibitor. And MAO is monoamine oxidase. And what it, that is is something that your gut produces that breaks down DMT when you eat it. That's why if you eat like Phalaris grass or something that's rich in DMT, you don't get high from it. The reason being this monoamine oxidase breaks it down inside your body. Well, these in ingenious people thousands of years ago figured out how to combine these two plants in this really complicated process where they brew it up and what they did is they created a slow release DMT trip and it's not from the people and again this is, I haven't had this experience so I'm just relaying from people that have it's not as intense not as like not as it's the DMT flash that you get when you smoke it you rarely reach that state, but you have this profound long-term experience that instead of taking 15 minutes, takes several hours. Wow. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to the, uh, the totality of how do you feel about, we're legalizing marijuana now. Here in my state, Nevada, you know, we've got medical marijuana at last. Uh, other states are completely legalizing it. Where is it going in America eventually with drugs? I mean, our jails are full of people for drug violations of one sort or another. How, what do you think? Well, locking people up for experimenting with their consciousness is criminal. I really think that. And it's very contradictory when you look at all the drugs that are legal, really intense, powerful drugs that are easy to get. Anybody who knows, if you ever had a back injury, you can get Oxycontin or all sorts of different painkillers like that. It's not hard to get. All you have to do is have a legit reason to have them. I had uh, this uh, guy, Chris Bell, on my podcast who made the documentary Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Right. It was a steroid documentary, mm-hmm. and uh, he injured himself. Uh, he had a hip surgery and uh, got hooked on Oxycontins. He's got a new prescription out called uh, Prescription Thugs. It's sort of dealing with the prescription drug business. So it, it's, there's plenty of drugs that perturb our consciousness. We can walk into any liquor store or any grocery store and buy enough booze to kill ourselves. So it's, it's not that anyone's protecting you from anything. What it is is we have sanctioned drugs, and these sanctioned drugs, they, you know, they get a lot of money from them, and then there's a lot of tax revenue to come out of it, and there's also a lot of people that have a vested interest in continuing to keep those drugs legal. All right, hold it right there. We'll be right back. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft, Pitcher, Oklahoma. It's a ghost town and former city in Ottawa County, Oklahoma. 
formerly a major national center of lead and zinc mining at the heart of the Tri-State Mining District. Over a century of unrestricted subsurface excavation dangerously undermined most of Pitcher's town buildings and left giant piles of toxic metal-contaminated mine tailings heaped throughout the area. The discovery of the cave-in risks, groundwater contamination, and health effects associated with the chat piles and subsurface shafts, particularly an alarming 1996 study which showed lead poisoning in 34% of the children in Pitcher. This eventually prompted a mandatory evacuation and buyout of the entire township by the state of Oklahoma and the incorporation of the town, along with the similarly contaminated satellite towns of Treese and Cardin. An F-4 tornado, which destroyed or damaged 150 homes in May 2008, accelerated the exodus. The town ceased official operations on September 1, 2009. Google knows what you did last summer. Now it shows it to you on Google Maps. Today, the Google Maps team launched a feature called Your Timeline. That is about where you've already been. It's not a social feature, as you're the only one who sees it. But it's a reminder of how much data Google has on all of us if we leave all of our defaults on. If you Google Photos, your pictures will appear along with the places you've stopped along the way. A Kansas woman said she stepped outside with her dog and noticed something unusual in the sky. The moon and the stars were gone. She said everyone came out of their house and were all pointing at the sky. And what they saw covering the sky was disturbing. The thing was dead silent, they said. Massive, so big, so huge. But the sighting didn't last long, and it took off with a blink of an eye and no noise. She said it wasn't round like a saucer. It was kind of like an arrowhead shape. The entire bottom of it was pitch black until it took off, and then it was multicolored lights at the bottom. As the object moved away, the woman's daughter became terrified. A former state trooper from Washington say that he is currently in contact with several Bigfoot creatures and that he feeds them food regularly. The man who provided a name but chose to remain anonymous said that the encounters have been happening since 2009 in a remote area in the North Cascades. He said sometimes it's five to ten minutes, other times they stay for hours. He says he leaves them apples, carrots, beef jerky, cookies, and candy bars. The man says he was looking for an old mine in the mountains the first time he came across the alleged beings in 2009. After leaving the food out there for him, he says they seem to have started following him and getting closer. He says he's been as close as 20 feet to some of them. He reports that he was so close to them that he was able to catch some of their language on two different occasions. He said it sounded like Native American and an Asian mix. The creatures reportedly stand between 6 and 7 feet tall and probably weigh in at about 500 pounds, females being a little lighter. He describes them as having a human face, some with dark hair, others red or brown, probably about 3 to 4 inches long, adding that the females had small breasts. He claims he's not the only one to have seen the creatures in the area. Numerous people have also purportedly seen them while accompanying the man. The former state trooper says the creatures have never presented a threat to him and that he leaves them alone and he's not interested in hunting them or gathering physical evidence. Florida resident John Byrd last year claimed to feed Bigfoot potatoes and plantains on a regular basis. In the spring of 1982, a soldier training at Fort Leonard Wood Army Base in Missouri claimed to have spotted a seven-foot-tall creature with brown hair that resembles the former state trooper's alleged sighting. Portions on the United States side of the range are part of the North Cascades National Park. There were reports revealing the intentions of the U.S. Army to annex part of the region as a helicopter training area, drawing criticism from the Forest Service employees for environmental ethics. I'm Leo Ashcraft. This has been Dark Matter News. Hey, Joe, um, what's your opinion of French dressing? French dressing? French dressing. Ranch ranch dressing. Oh, ranch dressing. Yeah, ranch dressing. There's something there. Yeah, that's my friend Joey Diaz has uh, a, a he's got a quote that you can't really say on this radio show. <laughs> okay, but it's either blue cheese with wings or <laughs> then something explicit. But that's uh, Joey Diaz. If you don't know who he is, he's the funniest person I believe the funniest person that's ever lived. When you do a, a, a podcast show, uh, do you need somebody to bounce 
off of? I mean, do, do you do it absolutely by yourself, or do you have somebody? No, no, do it? I ne- almost never do it by myself. I've done a few yeah. in the early days by myself, but uh, I either do them uh, with uh, just a bunch of different guests, or I do it with my occasional co-host, uh, Brian Redband. I did one of them today with him, who's a longtime friend of mine, and we just so we do one every week or so. We just go over crazy stories in in the internet. Yeah, you really need somebody if you're going to do comedy. You really need somebody there, don't you? Yeah, but they're not always comedy. See, my podcast is very confusing. Like, so it's in the comedy section, but sometimes I'm talking to professors. Uh, tomorrow, I'm talking to Jeff Novitsky, who is the guy who busted Lance Armstrong, wow. and uh, he's gonna. We're going to talk all about the different performance enhancing drugs they use on the Tour de France and how they avoid getting caught and what's going on right now in professional sports where they test and how they get around these things. He's a guy that was hired by the UFC recently to clean up the sport. Uh, the UFC has uh, quite a, an image issue when it comes to performance-enhancing drugs. Mixed martial arts in general does. There's just so much on the line for these guys that a lot of them are willing to uh, take chances with illegal substances. And uh, we're going to discuss that tomorrow. So is, is, the UFC, is, is the UFC real? Oh, it's 100% real. Yeah. 100% real, huh? 100%. Whereas yeah. regular wrestling... Well, regular. Have you ever watched the UFC? Um, I, it comes time, yeah. Well, you're up in Pahrump, right? You're, that's you're right. up in. That's... If you ever want to come down, there's a big event that's going on September 4th. I would love to have you come down and uh, introduce you to the world of the UFC. And if you saw it live, you would not for a second think that there's anything fake going on. It well, is... you know what some of the rep of, of regular wrestling was. I mean, so. Well, of course. Regular wrestling is is entertainment. It's 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 a choreographed entertainment show, no different than a play. And a lot of people love it. It's not my cup of tea, but a lot of people really enjoy it because it's fun, it's crazy, and it's wild. The UFC is very different. It's it's a much more primal experience, and it, it is absolutely one hundred percent non scripted and real. So, kind of like Fear Factor. <laughs> <laughs> some, some ways, Your factor was scripted in sense of we knew what the stunts would be, but as far as the reactions, yes, exactly. All right, um, <laughs> all right staying or, or extending from DMT, I understand that you have been, this really interests me, uh, Joe, you experiment with sensory deprivation chambers, true? Yes, I have one in my house. Um, I have one in my basement, and um, uh, I have been a big fan of them. I first got one in 2002. I got my first one. And um, I'd heard about them years before from really originally from that Altered States movie. Right. That right. was where I was first introduced to them. And then uh, I got into John Lilly's books. I read uh, some of his stuff on them. And then I realized that that Altered States movie was actually based, a, a lot of it was based on him. Uh, the crazy, if you don't know who Lilly is, John Lilly was uh, the guy who invented the sensory deprivation tank, and uh, he was a pioneer in interspecies communication. He would, he would do all these uh, experiments on dolphins and trying to communicate with dolphins, and one of the things he used to do is he used to take LSD and set up a sensory deprivation tank near dolphins and try to communicate with them. Wow. Yeah, he was out there. All right, so describe to me the sensory tank uh, experience. It, it, is it warm water? Is it cool? yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, the water is the same temperature as the surface of your skin, which is about ninety three and a half degrees. There's uh, in my tank. I have a tank from the Float Lab in Venice, which is uh, there's a guy named Crash who runs the Float Lab, who really when the tanks were very unpopular, when no one knew about them, when they, I mean right now their experience is tremendous renaissance, and I'm very happy that I'm a part of that and Crash is a part of that too because he's the guy who really innovated and took tanks to this incredible uh, level of sophistication that they have now and he's the one who designed the one that I have in my basement and it has a um, thousand pounds of Epsom salts in this water and the water is about a foot deep and you just get in the tank and because there's so much salt you float and because the water is the same temperature as your skin right. once you sit in it for a minute and you relax and stop moving you can't really differentiate between where the water is and where the air is. It all feels like one thing. It feels like you're flying. And you have this weird experience, this weird, weird sensation of flying through space. Have you not done it? No, I haven't done it. Oh, uh, ever God, since Altered States, I've wanted to try there. it. Wanted to try oh, it. Please, please come to California as my <laughs> guest. I'll bring you to the Float Lab. We'll introduce you to Crash because he's a trip in and of himself. 
and uh, get you in one of these tanks. It's amazing. And it's very relaxing, too. It's very therapeutic for your muscles. It's great for your body because it gives you this feeling of weightlessness, and it relieves all the tension in your muscles. And it's also a great way for your body to absorb magnesium because the Epsom salts contain magnesium, and it's absorbed through the skin. So it's actually really good for you as well as being relaxing and in certain situations, you can experience some pretty intense psychedelic experience. Ah, uh, that's what I was going to ask. It, it, yeah. it, so altered states and maybe even more altered states. Yeah, well, some people like to, uh, I, I, I personally am a big fan of consuming cannabis and then getting in there, uh-huh. especially uh, eating it. Um, but uh, some people like to do it with uh, all kinds of different stuff, mushrooms. Uh, Lily was a big fan of ketamine. He used to take uh-huh. ketamine and then climb into the tank. That's another hard hit, boy. Ketamine. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a little beyond my reach. <laughs> <laughs> That one's uh, that's a spooky one, but the idea being is that when the mind has no internal or it was no external information coming at it, it creates. Just, yes, it creates, and it also because it's no longer processing all the data like your balance and social cues and looking at people and just touching and feeling things, engaging your distance. Because you can't can't see anything, you can't hear anything, you don't feel anything. Your body's free, and your mind has an incredible amount of resources that it usually doesn't have. The way I always describe it to people is that if you and I were having a conversation, but next to us there was a guy working a jackhammer, it would be very hard to keep the conversation, to very hard to focus. Absolutely, well, sure. But the life is kind of a jackhammer. Life is constantly giving you information, just from the sensation of the ground under your feet, the sensation of the clothes on your body. Especially uh, if you're in the business we are, it's constant. It is constant, and it's hard to to just let it all go. And I, for me personally, my, the way my body and mind work, I find the tank to be almost irreplaceable. It's one of the most important things that I've ever experienced as far as like just being able to unwind and think about stuff and have a perspective. And I've, I've come to so many conclusions while I've been in there, made so many decisions that I might not have made while I was in there, and it just sort of guides me in a weird way. So good decisions. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever made a bad decision in the tank. <laughs> as weird as that sounds. I made a lot of them in the shower. So I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me, me too, like singing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, a couple of calls. Um, Skype, you're on with Joe Rogan. Hi. Hi, how are you? Just fine. Go ahead. I, I wanted to say, uh, I don't know if Joe remembers me. I was actually a contestant on uh, Fear Factor. Whoa. I, I believe what it was season, season two. On? What season were you on? Do you know? Uh, season two. Season two. Do you remember what you had to do? Of course you probably do. Oh, yeah. I had to, I believe it was an elk's penis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we were in the park? Were you, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was um, Griffith Park. Is that what it was? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. What's your name, man? Oh, my name's Dwight. Okay, Dwight. What's going on, dude? Oh, not a lot, man. I catch you all the time when you're on UFC, and uh, uh, I especially loved when you were on Chappelle show and you did the uh, parody of Fear Factor. That's too bad. Um, that's right. I took care of it. I have a button for that. Um, Kansas. I, just, I couldn't remember his name. I was like, hmm, that's... Yeah, I strange. he's not that good, but... Yeah. Kansas City, you're on with Joe. Hi. Hello. Oh, hey, is that me? Yes, you. Oh, hey, I just wanted to ask Joe. I know this is not a sports show, but he was so excited when Rousey won. What was that like to be there when that happened? Oh, when Ronda Rousey won in Brazil a couple weeks ago. It was incredible. I felt like yeah. it, was, it was a historical event as much as it was uh, a fight. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it was, it was a mismatch and the, the girl wasn't as good as she was. And I think that's all very fair and true. But I think that what she represents right now is something wholly unique, this incredibly dominant female combat sports athlete. And uh, I just think what, what she's been able to accomplish in just a short amount of time as far as raising the public's perception, I felt like I was there for history. I felt like, I think, like, there's guys that tell their kids, hey, I was there when Muhammad Ali, when Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston. And it kind of felt like that to me, like that kind of thing. Like, you were there when something historical happened. Oh, it was so incredible, yeah. I wonder if you, what she's going to do next. <laughs> Uh, she's going to keep fighting, I'm sure, for a little while. But I, I imagine with all the lucrative movie offers that she's getting, when she feels like she's accomplished enough, she'll move on and just do whatever she wants to do. 
Joe, have you uh, have you seen a, a new TV show? Actually, not so new. Three, four seasons now. Uh, Naked and Afraid. Yes. Yeah, I have seen it. That thing is wild. Uh, I wonder how far so-called reality TV is going to go. I mean, you I take somebody how, completely like, naked, a man and woman, throw them in the middle of Borneo, yeah. and something bad's going to happen. Well, it's certainly dangerous. Um, I don't know how much they monitor them. I mean, it's hard when it's naked and afraid. doesn't mean naked, afraid, and alone. So I don't know how many people are there watching them while this goes on and what kind of a you know, a medical crew they have standing by. You know, I, I'm not sure. So. Well, they, they do. They've got a producer, and then they've got a little medical crew. But, yeah, dangerous. Oh, definitely. But bizarre, too. You know, like, why, why are we doing this? Like, why are we exposing people to, to this? Like, what is, what is it about these silly shows that makes us uh, so excited? And also, it's, it's, it's a great wake-up call for people when you realize how vulnerable you actually are out alone in the woods and how difficult it is to survive. Yeah, Actually, with no shoes, I mean, that. imagine, no shoes, and you're walking on these, oh, God, it's awful. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, I mean, you know, I mean, how much further can reality TV go? It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, I, when we were on Fear Fact, I used to joke around and say we're about three seasons away from The Running Man. <laughs> but we might have already passed that with something like Naked and Afraid. I mean, we might we might someday see something perhaps like it from another country where, you know, we we're seeing some sort of deadliest game sort of a thing where people are hunting people. That's entirely possible. I mean, well, they, they made have, movies about it. Yeah. I mean, they have these, uh, team fighting, uh, sports in Russia now where they'll have like five people fight five people right. inside a cage right. and, it's like, and they're two on one. And it's crazy. It's horrible to watch. And it, but it's, what they're doing is they're taking things like people tend to do to the most extreme place. Sure. West Virginia, you're on with Joe. Hi. Yeah. Um, I thought that uh, the expression Joe used about uh, DMT was really interesting, especially... Uh, what expression? Uh, the uh, how it finds you. Oh. Because uh, I was following the dead in uh, 2003, and uh, I was a part of that scene going coast to coast. And uh, some guy offered me something that looked like sesame seeds, but they were like dark and amber, amberish color. Uh, it was uh, it was quite an experience. But yeah. the well, really that's, that's one thing, thing you never do is give somebody a drug that they're uninformed about. That's about the worst thing. I I can't even imagine uh, receiving. Well, see, there was uh, or the whole tour. There was talk about DMT going around that somebody was divvying it out allegedly but well, this isn't, thing that I was, yeah but I'm sorry isn't this after Jerry Garcia was dead didn't he die in like the 90s yeah yeah but so they kept touring uh, uh, yeah because <laughs> if you think about it, Joe if you go back to the discography there's they there's the other two guys sung a lot too uh, just as much as Jerry but the real point that I wanted to make tonight to uh, really open uh, your mind up a little bit more, uh, you know, talking about the UFO community and stuff like that, is, uh, you know, I believe that mind-altering substances is a gateway, you know, for us not to only be able to see no. interdimensional beings and extraterrestrials, but to communicate. Uh, but those substances are strong tools used in mind control and ritual abuse. And and I'll take my uh, the comments off there. Thank you, guys. It's All right. to be talking to both together. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Joe, what, what, what do you think? Well, I think there's definitely been some experiments for um, using psychedelic substances for mind control. That's that's a fact. Um, and there's a, a great documentary called The Net that is actually about um, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, and Ted Kaczynski being a part of the Harvard LSD studies. And it, there was a lot of studies that were done uh, by the military that are well documented, uh, where they were experimenting with LSD on soldiers, try to see what the effects were, right. and how they could use them to manipulate people's minds and, and frame and get them to do things that they wanted them to do. You know, the whole idea about Manchurian candidates, those things, that's, those are all real experiments for sure. They definitely have tried to do that before. Okay, real quick. Whether or not they've been successful. Right. Don, real quickly, you're on with Joe. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Uh, nice to see you back, Art. Thank you. Uh, glad, to, glad to be here. Um, Joe, I have a UFC question for you, if, uh, okay. if you could answer that. Sure. Um, 
The guy asked earlier about Ronda Rousey, and he got uh-huh. me wondering. Uh, you really, you said it was really special being there, seeing her do that. Out of yeah. all the other fighters and fighters, you know, fights you've seen, uh, which ones felt the most supernatural? Like you were seeing something special, other than other than her. What are, What are the top guys that just you felt like you were seeing something epic? Well, I never got to see Fedor fight in his prime. I would have loved to see that, but I did get to see Anderson fight in his prime, and Anderson. Yeah, Anderson Silva, who I think is the greatest of all time. I, I think he he moved like a guy in a video game. He would do things that didn't seem real, like things that were from a movie. He in in his prime when he was at the top, he was just spectacular. Like you, he would have what uh, Lorenzo Fertitta, one of the owners of the UFC, uh, always refers to as the holy s moment. Like that, every great UFC has at least one holy s moment. Right, and right. Anderson really defined that to me. He was he was just so incredible when he was at his best. All right, not a lot of time. Pismo yes. Beach, you're on with Joe. Hi. I, I, Oh my! Oh my God! Am I on on you, the air? You are with my two heroes. I can't believe it. Okay, I have I have two questions for you. One of them is serious, and one of them is silly. Uh, the silly one is: What kind of motorcycles do you guys ride? The real question that I'm calling about, and I understand, Joe, if you don't want to talk about it, but I'm still going to ask. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, news radio was like genius it was the best thing that ever happened to tv and i still love it and um when when phil died i my question is was there any animosity on the set towards andy dick i just said dick on the radio it's his name um yeah but um was there any of that because uh, i've i know the rumors i'm sure you do uh better than any of us do that's my question Oh, you mean the rumors that he got Phil's wife the drugs and that's what led her? To, I don't blame anybody for that other than his wife. And even his own wife was, was on a cocktail of SSRIs and cocaine, and she was probably psychotic at the time. This is a terrible, terrible event. To your first question, I don't ride motorcycles. so uh, I don't either. I, 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 I used to. Uh, I learned about gravel and motorcycles. That, that cured me. I came close. I took the motorcycle safety courses. I was thinking about buying one. And then two of my friends uh, who had bikes, one got hit by a car and one fell on his bike and hurt themselves real bad. And I was like, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to sit this one out. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you a bit. Um, so what does the future hold for you? Uh, more of what I'm doing. I really, really enjoy doing the podcast. And I really enjoy doing stand-up comedy. Uh, and I really enjoy working for the UFC. I'm very fortunate that I have these things that I enjoy very much as far as, like, you know, my career. Uh, I've just been uh, real lucky to be able to do a lot of fun stuff. And it's led me to be able to talk to you, which is one of the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about what we do. It's fun. I love it. Joe Rogan. Man, thank you. And I, you, you know what? Sir. I may it's take you up. Honor. I may take you up on that uh, that offer about the tank. Please do the tank and the UFC anytime you want. It's an open invitation. You got all right. Coming up now, David Sarita. Believe it or not, kind of hate stuff. I really hate reading this. Began his career by being interviewed by me <laughs> for the first time in the year two thousand. He was a regular guest on the show. And has been since seen on Ancient Aliens, History Channel, TLC, Fox News, CNN, Toast for uh, the past 15 years. David Sarita did his first radio show appearance in the, in the year 2000 with me on the NASA UFO phenomena. The NASA STF-75 UFO's pulse and the frequency use of pulsing by ETs. After seeing a UFO in 68 with dozens of other witnesses in Berkeley... David's first first aspiration in life was to become an astronaut or to learn how to make ET contact. Interesting uh, choice, but kind of related, really, I guess. He studied world religions, meditation, yoga, nuclear fusion for nearly a decade with world-class physicists. Physicists. (laughs) He brings you his personal experience with ET contact and human transformation as well as scientific understanding. Hello there. Again, David did his first radio show appearance in 2000 with me. So it's interesting now to have him back. David, welcome back to the program. 
Uh, you are there somewhere. Hello? Sure, I think it was there you are. 1999 or 2000. Yeah. I can't remember. Well, a long time ago anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is going to be an interesting evening. You have sent me some audio files, which I am prepared, by the way, to play when we get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, you're claiming, David, that you have made ET contact, right? I am claiming that, yeah. I mean, after an entire life of trying to figure this out, you know, going back to my UFO sighting in Berkeley in 1968, which was followed by contact with Palladian beings in my sleep at a time when there was no such thing as ufology and there was no such thing as, you know, the Art Bell Show. So I didn't know where to go with it at the time. But uh, it's taken me my whole life, I'm 54 this week, to figure it out. Yeah, that's true. Uh, before this kind of thing really began, there was nowhere to go, except maybe a psychiatrist, my recommendation, or something like that. Yeah, and my dad was getting his, you know, we're Canadians who moved to Berkeley in 1964, and my dad, Lynn Sarita, was getting his PhD in psychology there. And when I told him and my mom that I saw the flying saucer, I mean, they didn't even say anything. They, they really didn't know what to to make of it, but I, this was a daytime thing. Walking home from elementary school at the um, um, in the East Bay near the Berkeley campus, you know, we were living in the University Village, and everybody saw this thing. I mean, it looked like one of the Meyer craft, but this is this is 1967 or 68, so it's before he took all those photos. And in the following days, beings identified the Pallades star system not using the name Pallades. They were very tall and kind, and they paralyzed me in the uh, very, you know, famous uh, classic case of sleep paralysis and started showing me how their craft worked. And, you know, and right at that pivotal time in 1967-68, my mom was divorcing my dad. because I, You know, the, I was going to go back to you yeah. telling your parents. I mean, that's really something to do. Mom, dad, I'm in contact with uh, others. Uh, and then I suppose once you were out of earshot, they were asking each other, did you drop them? No, honey, did you drop them? <laughs> Wondering about you, how did they take it? Well, actually, my mom did drop me. She, she <laughs> rolled me off the, the <laughs> dining room table. She finally told me only a few years ago. <laughs> was, it immediate, uh, was this, well, obviously far after you told them that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, they they dropped me before when I was only a few you know weeks old when my mom was changing the diapers. She didn't think babies at that age would roll over. And I rolled over and hit the floor, oh, and she raced me to the hospital. Okay. But you know, this was something everybody saw. I mean, there was pandemonium on the street. You know, it wasn't the Goodyear blimp. This thing was a flying saucer, and the only thing I could relate it to was the Star Trek crew and the Enterprise and. No markings, um, not a single rivet. This thing was down close so that everyone could see it. And remarkably, many years later, I was, I was lecturing at a UFO convention for Bob Brown in, in Nevada. Actually, one of the last conferences he ever did. I gave the very last lecture under Bob Brown in his entire career there. And this man approaches me in the elevator and he said, I work at the space lab at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab right up on the hill. Huh. And I said, oh, yeah, I've been there. I actually had lunch with Glenn Seaborg there, the who was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission under Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, and the scientist who discovered um, the explosive type of plutonium, won the Nobel Prize. And I said, I even told Seaborg, Glenn Seaborg, that I saw the UFO, and this lab would have had a good view of it. Well, this gentleman told me, I work at the lab, I'm a scientist at the space lab, and in 1972, all of us saw a flying saucer come right up to the window. And that would have been a great, uh, many very, very prominent scientists working up at that lab who saw it. And how many of them wanted to talk about it? And not one. Yeah. And and Seaborg didn't look at me crazy that day when I said I saw the saucer. He said... His assistant, Albert Giorso, had um, 37 levels above top secret, he mm. told me Seaborg had. And, he, and Seaborg said, there's nobody working on anything like that in our government. So he said, I don't know what it was. Was it Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I think it was, uh, where they were showing the air traffic controller and uh, the plane saw a UFO just right by it? Uh the controller said, uh, you want to report this? No, nah, I don't want to report one of those. 
Well, that's my favorite movie of all time, so I know that scene so well. And <laughs> it, exactly. So what do you do in 1968? You know, there's no UFO conventions that I knew of. I mean, I'm a kid, and they're appearing to me over and over, and, and you know, I'm starting to play kick the can and hide and go seek with my friends. We moved to the San, um, the San Francisco side of the Bay. We were living on the Berkeley side at that time. And I'm counting to a hundred looking at the Pleiades and remembering the star system, remembering them and replaying the memory of the flying saucer in my head over and over and over again. And I would never even blink the rest of my life until in 1972 ish, 73, the Meyer story was on the news in Canada. We moved back to Canada to live with my real father because my mom divorced again. And then I said, Oh my God, that's what I saw. So that was the beginning of being able to place the experience. But to not make contact with them again my entire life didn't make any sense. Why would they, you know, single me out in the crowd? And I don't know how many other kids or people. They they always single people out. Um, No question about it. Listen, uh, let me back up a little bit. I wonder, you're going to talk a lot about quantum. Uh, physics, I believe, tonight, in the sense that you believe that quantum communication is going to be possible. Is that correct? Uh, electrically possible, yeah. Electrically, okay. I still don't have a grasp of quantum physics. Now, I'm not sure anybody really does, but there's this thing where called entanglement. You know about that, right? Where, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, nobody can really explain it. And I don't expect you to, but if you have any thoughts on it, I'd love to hear them because I'm struggling with it. Well, okay, so we, you know, going back to the time of Einstein and and many of his co-researchers, and Einstein was not an educated physicist. He was he was self-taught, self-educated, right, and became a Nobel Prize winner. And and all his peers, who are in my appearance, in my mind, are much more brilliant than he is. Um, the way they appear in my mind, I mean, and Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, and these guys are saying that there's something going on when researchers are getting near the experiments. Their consciousness seems to be affecting the behavior of the particles when you're looking at these explosions of subatomic particles and bubble chambers and cloud chambers, which is how they used to photograph subatomic particle explosions. So that was the beginning of the idea that consciousness was part of the whole thing, the whole universe. And Einstein really agreed that there was something going on, and so did so did Max Planck, and so did Niels Bohr. All of them did. All of them knew. And then there was this thing that Einstein called spooky action at a distance, was right. that, you know, normally communication via radio or the Internet, like we're using now, everything travels through electromagnetism in the, at the speed of light, which is very slow at 186,282 miles per second. Right. So Einstein noticed there was this, this function in the atom and smaller. Quantum mechanics is generally looking at functions in the atom and smaller, and, it, and nowadays it seems to include the, the study of consciousness, but consciousness is not exclusive. Well, I can see how consciousness will get involved in this, maybe, but, you know, the whole idea that it, it's so simple and so impossible, this entanglement business, and that is where one flips and the other flops, right. and it'll do it reliably. If you do a flip here, you'll flop there, and you can separate these by thousands of miles, five feet, or uh, you could take one to the moon, and they would be flipping and flopping in unison, in apparent, I say apparent, communication with each other at much greater than speed of light. In fact, immeasurably fast, and we have no clue how that's happening. Uh, there has to be a communication. There has to be a communication going on, or how can one flip and the other know to flop? Exactly. That That's exactly it. It's called action at a distance, and it's faster than light. It's instantaneous, but it it's not relying on the electromagnetic spectrum or radio waves to communicate. Right. I'm with you there. Yeah. So they don't as a wave. So because it's they can't see the wave, or of course, we don't know how to measure wavelengths even at the Planck length or smaller, the smallest units ever measured. So we don't know if it's a wave or not, actually, but... 
we know it's there and scientists know it's there and it's it's been notable since the time of Einstein, Niels Bohr and Planck and all of the great masters. So why aren't we using it? In And we are. I'm going to be talking about tonight how I've been able to use it in talking to very distant star systems. Uh-huh. Well, and look, I, here's the deal. Here, here's the deal. If, if we are ever going to get to another star system, um, we're going to have to figure out how this communication works and either use it to communicate or use it in some way to travel because, oh, I don't know, this recent Earth 2 they found, it's a thousand light years away. A thousand light years. So we're not getting... Not get- very far, actually. Well... Incredibly uh-huh. close. See, this is where it gets really exciting for me because, you know, you're a radio man. You know how radio works. I know how long it would any- take for radio to get there at, at current speeds. Yeah, but you know, so I'll tell you how the quantum function works and how we can use it and sure. why this Russian billionaire Yuri is wasting, Yuri Miller is wasting his money looking at radio waves. All right, all right wait, hold, hold on, hold on. We've got, we have steady. to do a break. Hold on. We have to do a break. You're going exactly where I want you to go. And you know, just a few nights ago, not very many nights ago, we had Seth Shostak here. Seth is, of course, uh, the head of SETI, and uh, he would be, I'm sure, distressed to hear what David is about to say, um, as would the Russian uh, billionaire, I guess. Uh, he's given a lot of money so they can keep searching for uh, radio signals from elsewhere, right? Uh, and and actually, you, you'd think it's a big waste of uh, money or rubles, whatever. Rubles, money, time, and, and I think even Seth knows it, that they're just, you know, so bored over there, probably <laughs> far more bored than the beginning of the movie Contact, you know, kind of. Actually, that book, the book Contact is phenomenal. Yes, Carl it Sagan is. I, goes, I don't blame them for looking. I mean, look, it's. It, <laughs> I think I would be looking too. Now, I think I would be getting to the point where I'd be almost ready to say we've looked at just about everything, frankly, and there's nothing to be heard. Well, exactly. There's there's nothing to be heard, and there's never been anything to be heard in the radio bands, and that's why I think it's a waste of money. And because we know this quantum function is faster than light. We do, but we don't know how to use it. We do. We do, and that's what I'm going to talk about. There's, see, you know, there's a biophysicist named Fritz Albert Popp in Germany who proved that living photons, living, you know, particles of light that come off living things, plants mainly and humans and mammals, marine mammals, dolphins, all of them, it travels faster than the speed of light. So there's something about a living light, you know, auric field that can actually be measured by a good physicist to travel faster than light. But how do you tell it where to go? Wait a how minute. Do you wait, wait a minute. How do you send? know? How do, I know what an aura is or an auric yeah. field. But how how has anybody proven that it travels faster than light? Well, Fritz Albert Pop took actual measurements using atomic clocks with plants and measuring the speed of the emissions, which were... In the, in the visible band of light as well as the invisible. Now, j- just that point alone, we're not looking at radio waves today, not even in the giga spectrum that are even close to the color red. So when you're, when Fritz Albert Pop is saying that visible light photons coming off of plants and humans are, are able to go faster than the speed of light, we're not able to do that yet. We don't look at like, you know, AM radio is amplitude modulated, FM is frequency modulated. So mm-hmm. you frequency modulate data, information, voices, pictures, and everything on a radio wave, and it travels at the speed of light, kind of like passengers on a train. And in the AM band, you you amplitude modulate the process of getting the data on the band. Yeah. Okay. But those bandwidths are still nowhere near those colors. So we're nowhere near transmitting and looking at data inside of actual Visible light, because visible light is way higher in frequency than... Okay, well, one of the... I believe one of the goals of SETI was to begin looking at the light spectrum, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, but see, that's where you have to get... You need a sensor 
and you need transistors to amplify the signal up to the point that you can actually look at it. And transistors are getting so, so small now. Like a single Intel computer chip has billions of tiny quartz crystal transistors right. you know, floating on it. And it's all made, you know, literally it's made under microscopes. I mean, you can't see these transistors anymore. I remember the first transistor radios when they came out and they replaced the tubes. And you, because they found crystals have tons of, you know, unbound electrons floating on their surfaces. They're very powerful, crystals are. And therefore, they could use them to amplify signals. And those those transistors got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. But one of the things I did is I looked at the Great Pyramid as a giant crystal oscillator. And I did a huge amount of math on it. It took me a year to calculate all the frequencies the pyramid would generate. And that's when I became convinced. When I looked at wait, the wait, numbers. Wait, wait, wait. The pyramid would generate or does generate? It would when it was operating. Because, you see, the way a crystal oscillator works is, see, there's two things in electronics that make radio possible. You know, Tesla is the true father of radios. Sir Oliver Lodge and Stone developed the tuning circuits for radio. But Tesla, you know, uh, broadcast radio in, I think it was 1893, Chicago World's Fair. And then Marconi, as a lab assistant, allegedly steals it from him. And then it just goes on from there. So radio uses... It uses a crystal oscillator to generate a frequency. Right. And the the, free, the way you cut crystal in its size and you excite electrons in it within a certain amount of, of uh, voltage and current, you, d- you generate different frequencies in the crystal. So the crystal is responsible for the frequency. So whenever you have two oscillators at the same frequency, you have communication. So if everybody's listening to you on an FM band, a frequency modulated band, and they all tune their quartz oscillators via their technology to that frequency, we're all together, all hearing our bell. Now, that's only part of radio. The other part of radio was we used to use tubes to amplify the signal because it's so weak with these crystal oscillators so that you could actually hear something. Well, transistors perform the same function with less noise. Right. So then we moved on to transistors, and they're the same. They're made out of quartz. You know, they used to make them out of germanium crystal and quartz. And so the crystals are doing the work, and they're doing the tuning and the amplification part of the job. But they don't have the ability to go faster than light. And this is where it's starting to get really interesting, because what I did in – it was before 2010 on my birthday, which is which is this Friday, uh, years ago. I decided to actually calculate the frequencies of the Palladian star systems, and I knew how to do it because NASA uses this system called parallax to determine the radius of the star. And if I, they know the radius of five Palladian stars, 440 light years away. So you're talking about this new exoplanet that's. It's 100,000 light years away. So not, uh, I mean, sorry, no, 1,000 light years away. 1,000 light years, yes. So the Pleiades are 440-ish. You know, there's diff- different depths of stars. and But if you know the radius, you can calculate the frequency really easily. So I, I calculated the frequencies of five Palladian suns because NASA knows the radius of five of them. And I, I immediately understood that, first of all, that Tesla actually measured the frequency of the Earth, and Schumann confirmed it, and that every planet and every star has its own frequency, and they're all different because they're all different wavelengths. They're all different sizes. Yeah, that makes sense. So you take the circumference of the Earth, the speed of light divided by that. It doesn't matter whether you do it in metric or feet and inches. If your resolution is good, you get the same frequency. So I did that for Pallades, and then I... I had to do this mathematical scaling technique to scale up the sides of the sphere on the stars. And I generated the frequencies of the Pleiades. And and, and what does radio tell us? It tells us that any two frequencies generated that are the same regardless of their distance, you have communication, at least at the speed of light. And and that would be too slow with Pleiades. But my body's biophotons send signals faster than light according to quantum 
mechanics. And according to Einstein, and according to... Okay, I am not familiar with anybody who has measured, and if you, you can point me in the direction, I'd be gr- glad to read about it, but um, our auras, they do exist, they can be measured, but I don't think we know the speed of the emission from them. Yeah, that's that's Rich, Fritz Albert Popp, German physicist, very good physicist, classically trained. He's the one who did it. He's the first one who did it. How in the world? Uh, you said using an atomic clock? Sure. You, you use atomic clocks to measure the speed of a transmission of one a signal to a receiver. And that he he did over and over again. So what he's saying is very remarkable because – Einstein's saying we don't know what the function in quantum mechanics is that this action at a distance, that if you flip this, you know, uh, right. particle over on and it was it was entangled with another one, regardless of their distance, they respond instantaneously. And then they did experiments with mothers and baby rabbits where they they connect their their nervous system to electrodes and they read it on on an EEG. If you pinprick the baby, the mother responds instantly, not at the speed of light, instantly through this function. So yeah, I, I, systems, might, I might buy that, and uh, that that somehow brings us to the consciousness thing. I think it does, and and that's where now Google this, everybody. Google DNA transistors, and you're going to see this happened years ago. the the, the military was developing transistors that interfaced with living tissue because of exactly what I'm talking about. Living tissue has the ability to do this. And you're going to start to see why uh, Colonel Philip Corso said that the Roswell ETs were half living, half um, technology, half um, literally solid-state technology. And, I, you know, I've had so, a lot of people on recently that have sort of debunked Corso. Uh, you're obviously not one of them. Well... I, I, I'm really deep into Roswell. I mean, I have a lot of data from my friend Boyd Bushman at Lockheed who passed away. Um, and they... All right. You I'm, could really go into this. I mean... Well, we could. Hold on. We're at a break. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft. Is our universe a fake? An elaborate computer simulation? Philosopher Nick Bostrom, director of the Future of Humanity Institute of Oxford University, describes a fake universe as a richly detailed software simulation of people, including their historical predecessors. He says this fake universe was created by a very technologically advanced civilization. David Wren, sci-fi writer and space scientist, relates the Chinese parable of an emperor dreaming that he was a butterfly, dreaming that he was an emperor. In contemporary versions, Bryn said it may be the year 2050, and people are living in a computer simulation of what life was like in the early 21st century. Or it may be billions of years from now, and people are in the simulation of what primitive plants and people were once like. David said he began bemused. The notion that humanity might be living in an artificial reality, a simulated universe, seemed sophomoric, at best science fiction. But speaking with scientists and philosophers on Closer to the Truth, he says he realizes that the notion that everything humans see and know is a gigantic computer game of sorts, the creation of super smart hackers existing somewhere else, is not a joke. Exploring a whole world simulation, he says he discovered, is a deep probe of reality. Check out the video from Closer to the Truth at darkmatternews.com. Well, we might be a little closer to interplanetary travel after scientists have recently confirmed that an electromagnetic propulsion drive, which is fast enough to get to the moon in four hours, actually works. The EM drive was developed by the British inventor Roger Shawyer nearly 15 years ago, but was ridiculed at the time as being scientifically impossible. It produces thrust by using solar power to generate multiple microwaves that move back and forth in an enclosed chamber. This means that until something fails or wears down, theoretically the engine could keep running forever without the need for rocket fuel. The drive, which has been likened to Star Trek's impulse drive, has left scientists scratching their heads because it defies one of the fundamental concepts of physics. The conservation of momentum, which states that if something is propelled forward, something must be pushed in the opposite direction. So the forces inside the chamber should cancel each other out. In recent years, though, NASA has confirmed that they believe it works. And this week, Martin Toshmore, professor and chair for space systems at Dresden University of Technology in Germany, also showed that it does produce thrust. (laughs) 
It seems like close encounters of the window seat kind are happening more frequently these days. Videos have been released of three different UFO sightings near commercial aircraft that have occurred over the past several months, with more undoubtedly unrecorded or unreported. What's causing this sudden attraction of UFOs to airplanes? The most recent sighting has been getting a lot of publicity since it occurred at JFK Airport at New York City while the plane was taking off. The video taken by an anonymous plane enthusiast shows a virgin Atlantic plane rising in the sky on July 7th and then being overtaken by a UFO seen flying above it. The cigar-shaped object is too close to be another commercial aircraft and no military jets were reported in the area. The next two sightings took place in England, one from June 12th over Lambourne, England, showing an airplane passing by a UFO, and the third sighting was made by a passenger inside a plane flying over Liverpool. There's been no definitive identification of any of these UFOs seen accompanying or passing the planes. Commercial and military pilots admit they see a lot of UFOs, but sightings by passengers and ground witnesses are less frequent. So what do you think these objects are? Why are they hanging around airplanes? Check out the photos and videos at darkmatternews.com and let us know your opinion. I'm Leo Ashcraft for Dark Matter News. Back now to David Sarita, and I've got some things I've, I've got to sort of get straight in my head, David. Um, and here they are. Uh, I think we're mixing things up a little bit. At courts, for example, um, indeed, if, uh, if you pass uh, an excitation through it, uh, current electricity, uh, depending on how it's cut, it will produce a certain frequency, and that is a crystal, right? But transistors are, you know, I just looked up a, oh, there he is. There he is. I thought we'd lost you. Transistors are made from various materials, and they're all semiconductors. I, I'm not really aware, and various types of materials for semiconductors, David, but I'm, I'm not aware that crystal is used in transistors. No, it, it is. Crystal is a semiconductor. And they, like, you have well, PNP or NPN transistors. Transistors get really complicated but they started with germanium they went to quartz and you know john bardeen will bratton and uh, one other physicist were the true fathers of the first transistor which is 1947 by the way and when it was invented and the way they make them now it's smaller and smaller and smaller so anything a semiconductor is a material basically cr- different types of crystal that has um, electrons, unbound electrons, that are not bound to the nucleus of an atom floating up on their surfaces, which makes them good amplifiers. So transistors amplify the signals, Mm. and the crystal oscillators generate frequencies. Well, they do that. Uh, All right, let's go back to uh, Colonel Corso for a moment, because I'm getting so many mixed messages. I interviewed Colonel Corso before he passed, as you know, a series of interviews, actually, and he claimed... That he turned over to a uh, private industry, piece by piece by piece, uh, technology gleaned from crashed um, UFOs, crashed um, the Roswell crash, frankly, and um, that a lot of what we have today is thanks to that. Now, I- I've had a lot of criticism lately of Colonel Corso, uh, people not believing his story. Where do you come down? Well, see, you know, we live in an, in an age where you can you can counter everything. You can say, like, when Boyd Bushman's story leaked um, prematurely over the internet about his photos of the alien, um, you know, it's you really got to go deep. I go really deep in my investigations. I mean, I studied the transistor, semiconductors, right. electronics. Okay. I make my own. Super inductive coils. You okay. know, coils you're, you're again. You're wandering away from the question, which is about Colonel Corso. Yeah, and that's that's my point. Do I believe his story? I I read the book, and I tend to believe him absolutely because I've seen the evidence firsthand at a level that I've never even revealed yet. I mean, I'm looking at photographs of an alien from Roswell given to me by Boyd Bushman where the flash on the camera seems have seems to have triggered a photoelectric response that sent out a wave that was captured in the photography and this is not a digital camera that was used this was 
a film camera and the wave coming out of the brain on this thing this thing is electronic i mean this thing are you is telling like, me you've got a picture of an alien creature that is not public this particular picture is not public no i i never went public with it would for you the, would for you? the reason art that people don't believe because they don't look at data deep enough they only look at the surface and when you look at the surface in an investigation you're it, it's too easy for people to disbelieve because they won't look at everything properly Right. And this particular photo disturbs me because, you know, I, I was a darkroom master photographer. I looked at film, real film, for 20 years before everything went digital. Okay, do you think it's legit? I've never seen anything like this. I, I, this I'm this i looking at a photograph with a true photoelectric response from the alleged alien or alien doll, or was it, like Corso said, an AI? Gee, and David, that, why don't you share this photograph with me? I will. I, I will. And I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a movie about it, but I want to do it piece by piece, part by part, because this thing really got messed up. This Boyd Bushman story really got messed up. But I believe exactly like he said, they are part AI and they, just like we are now doing, we're now making transistors that interface with living DNA for a very good reason because of the properties of DNA. In fact, the very first successful transistor that John Bardeen and Will Bratton invented was in, immersed in water. It worked in water, but when they took it out of the water, it didn't work. Wait, wait, wait David. Uh, gee, I'm sorry to stop you again, but you said we're making transistors that interface with human DNA. I didn't say human DNA. I said DNA. DNA. And okay, DNA. DNA is in the middle of every cell. You have the middle of the cell. You right. have the, the mitochondria, the power plant of the cell driving the DNA and the RNA, which builds the protein. So your DNA – now, th- this was a study done by uh, the found, the discoverer of the AIDS virus. Luc Montagne won the Nobel Prize for discovering the AIDS virus, and he does tests on DNA by inducting it with the frequency of Earth, inadvertently, 7 hertz. He was lower than the frequency of Earth. (laughs) So long wave radio. And the DNA responded to an ultra-low frequency like that. Really? And that was shocking. Actually, that's not shocking. I mean, why would that be shocking? We are creatures of the Earth. We come from the Earth. Depending on what you believe, God did it all in however many days or... We have slowly emerged from the muck of the earth. So we are part of the earth, are we not? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I'm not so surprised. So our DNA would read that frequency, and it shocked the researchers for only one reason, is the wavelength of DNA is so small as a coil, if you look at it as an inductor coil, and we can explain inductance really easily, that... Inductance is like, and I've done this in my house. So you take one coil, one like copper coil, wind up some wire around a cylinder and connect it to a signal generator. Generate a frequency and set it in front of your computer speakers and you'll hear a tone. You'll hear. I I can explain it even easier. The the new androids use uh, induction to charge. In other words, you take your Android phone, you put it on a little, you just lay it on this thing and it charges magically. That's induction. Yeah, that's induction. Induction is transferring yes. energy from one coil to another, and one of them doesn't have any power in it. That's so, right. But this is even a different um, function of induction. Is I, I get two Same coils idea, in the house, though. right? Same idea. I got one in front of my speakers, and I got a signal going through it. My speakers, you can hear the buzzing in the speaker. I go somewhere else in the house, and I plug another coil into another signal generator, and when I match the frequency... At a distance, I can hear the second coil in the other room through my speakers, and they're they're the same frequency, but they're not okay. in phase. They're they're slightly out of phase, that would and make that's sense. because when you have any two oscillators of any kind, it doesn't even have to be quartz that are the same frequency. You've set up a line of communication. Okay, so right. that's where it gets really interesting when you get into the the subject of induction, transferring energy from one coil to another, because right. if human DNA can be inducted by the frequency of Earth, which it makes sense, like you just said, right? Yes. And the frequency of Earth is where we dream. Seven, you know, seven point eight three hertz is is fundamental, but it actually it, it there's a whole range of frequencies because we have a sphere. When you have a sphere, 
your your wavelength at your equator is like seven and a half, or it's a little under seven and a half. And then by the time you're in Norway, you know you, you've got really high higher frequencies right. up there. But what's amazing about the frequency of Earth and the fact that DNA will read it is phenomenal. Because what that means, Art, is what I did. This is an experiment I just did recently. I take the wavelength of Pluto because we were, you know, we were going to Pluto with New Horizons, and I did this right in tandem when the New Horizons was going by Pluto. I'm lying in my bed, my daughter's asleep next to me and my wife, and I'm pulsing my body with one of my my transmitters with the frequency of Pluto. And suddenly I go out of body, I'm at Pluto, and I'm behind Pluto looking towards the sun, and Pluto has a huge atmosphere and all these beautiful colors. And then five seconds later, I'm back in my body, and I'm like, that was perfectly clear. I was out in space looking at Pluto, and NASA doesn't believe it could have an atmosphere. How could it have an atmosphere? It's an icy planet. Well, three days later, when New Horizons went beyond Pluto looking back at the sun, they were shocked. It had an atmosphere 1,500 miles deep, just as I had saw it, remote viewing it with the frequency of Pluto. With okay, my so you consciousness. remote viewed it. You weren't actually at Pluto. Well, no, you it, were it remote looked like viewing I was Pluto. there. Like, I didn't see it in my mind. <laughs> it's like suddenly I was jolted out of my body. There was this jolt, and I couldn't see my body. There was no astral body. Oh, okay. I was looking at Pluto in all perfect clarity, like a perfect movie. All right, now tell me about these frequencies that I'm staring at in front of me. Okay, what you're what you're staring at is is quite amazing cuz you know, using this system called parallax, NASA knows the radius of five Pleiadian stars. So let's start with Pleiades. And the the biggest star in Pleiades is um is um Alcyon. And Alcyon, what I've given you there are the tones where I take the wavelength of the star. And at the equator, you would never hear that because that's ultra, you know, very low frequency radio bands. You know, typically VLF is 3 to 30,000 hertz and, and Earth is 7.83 hertz. So when, and that's, look at the size of Earth. So when you look at the size of a star, and the Palladian suns are younger and bigger than our sun. They're very low frequencies. But the higher up the side of the star you go, the wavelength gets smaller and you can hear it. All right. And in fact, so. NASA actually recorded using a satellite the emissions coming from our sun and recorded the sound of our sun, which means all stars. Right. We have that also. Yeah. Let's do one at a time. You're claiming that the but sound I have here from Pleiades. Pleiades. Uh, and it's based on the mathematical radius of those five suns scaled. So when you play this, a lot of the file is inaudible, but it will transmit when you play it. The part that you're hearing is the higher you know, frequency bands up near the top, near the poles of right. the stars. All right. My, my question is, where did you obtain the recordings we're about to play? I didn't get, I didn't obtain the recordings. What I did is I got the radius on NASA's website and based on the radius, I calculated the frequencies, generated, scaled the frequencies mathematically and then generated them in a frequency generator and recorded it. Okay. So all I right, did it all right, so then we've got, it's, we've it's got the frequency accurate. according to you of Pleiades or it's, um, Alcyon, uh, right? Yeah, it starts with Alcyon. You're going to hear five tones, right. and they're all different because each one of those Palladian stars are different sizes. And how will this affect people? Well, what it actually does, especially if you induct the frequencies into people, is you start tuning to that star system, right? So your brain and your nervous system starts becoming tuned to Palladies, and that's how I made contact with Palladies. All right, I'm going to play this first one. Is that all right? Yeah, there'll be five tones. I, I understand. Okay, here we go. Here, everybody stand by and whatever happens, happens, I guess. I didn't like that last one so much. Yeah, that see actually they they sound 
if you listen to the sound of the sun, it's it's pretty powerful. It it's that's where we're going next. This it you say this is the sound or the frequency of our own sun. What we're about. well, it's a blend. You see, you never get one frequency in a sphere. You get a huge bandwidth of frequencies, and that's why you get a scaling of frequencies. So NASA did this recording of our sun that you're going to of play. our sun. Okay, this is from NASA. Is that correct? Yeah, it is from NASA. Here you go, folks. We've got awfully good audio equipment, uh, frankly. Awfully good. I wonder if that's coming through. People will have to tell me on the wormhole uh, if that's actually coming through. Um, our audio gear really is good. But you know what? The sound of the sun does, to me, sound like the sun. It really does. Uh, if you think of the desert and a really radiating, horrid, hot day, it might... It might sound like this. Sweat on the brow. Hot. Yeah. See, what NASA did there, Art, is they, you normally wouldn't hear the wavelength, so they compressed the data so that it was a little more dense. But actually, Pythagoras said in deep meditation, he actually heard the sun. He's one of the first to say it. In the Rig Veda, you know, one of these ancient Hindu manuscripts, the mantra Om that people chant is actually a uh, resemblance of the sound of the sun itself. And it goes deeper and deeper in different religious philosophies. The, the Logos, the actual Logos, this was the original Lord's Prayer in Aramaic and Christianity. Jesus is saying, O thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms with sound, light, and vibration. And he actually addresses Logos in, in John 1. And Logos actually is the sound of the sun. It's the sound of the cosmos. But for us, actually, all the planets are making sounds and frequencies, and so is the sun. Right. What's remarkable, when I measured the wavelengths of all nine planets, they match perfectly with all five human brainwave states. And that cannot be a coincidence. That is really interesting, actually, yes. It's tremendously interesting. And the fact that we dream at the frequency of our own planet means do Palladians dream at the frequency of their planet and their sun? And do all beings who live all over the universe That would be dream? logical, certainly. It would, it would make sense. In other words, we're we all products of... Theta? We yeah. don't dream in delta. We dream in theta, the frequency of Earth. And there's a huge bandwidth there. It's not one frequency like a lot of people think, 7.83. There's bandwidth. You know, Jupiter and Saturn are deep delta planets. Mars is alpha, alpha beta. Mercury is like just under 20 hertz where we allegedly start hearing, although I, I can hear much lower frequencies than that. And it, it, when I measure, I take NASA's radius. So here's how you do the frequency at the equator. You just take NASA's radius, which is exact on the nine planets, and you go times two to get the, the diameter of the planet, times pi to right. get the distance around the planet. Now, you take the speed of light divided by that, and that's the resonant frequency of the standing wave at the equator. But because it scales, the, you know, the distance around the Earth gets smaller as you get near the poles. You get this huge range of blending pulsing frequencies so that's what i did for pleiades i did it for sirius a and b and yeah, i've got sirius a and b here is it long do i have time no to it's do? very short very short very short all right it's a sample uh, yeah let's do it here it comes uh this will be Okay, so that's Sirius A and B, is that correct? And and B is almost the same frequency of Earth. I mean, Robert Temple brought this up in the Sirius Mystery. It's so close to our frequency because it's such a tiny little star that in a way we're already naturally tuned to it. And it makes sense because if you zoomed out in space – and you look back at our sun and you look at Sirius A and B and Alpha Centauri, we're like a little constellation. The distance between our stars is very similar to the distance between different Palladian suns in that little cluster. So we're so close. Like when you look at how each star is a different size, 
And that was actually breaking up a little bit. There's a, there's a little bit of scratching going on in there, and because they're very powerful frequencies. And but anyway, when you hear them in, in, in all their purity, they're with good speakers and everything. They're very very nice tones. But see, what it means is that if our brain waves all match the wavelengths of the nine planets, right? Then we are we are tuned to this solar system. All right. All right, so I want to roll over this uh, one more time with David. And the way these uh, tones are derived, other than the sun, which was actually measured by NASA, very interesting. Uh, but these other tones um, are derived by measuring the planet itself. In other words, very much like our own Earth, measuring the uh, the size of the planet and various things. And then... And then coming up with the tone, much as you would uh, uh, for, for Earth. Is that correct, David? The wavelength, you can even read this on Wikipedia, that the, the circumference of the planet is right. the basis for the, the frequency. Because the electromagnetic signal is basically oscillating around the planet. And it doesn't do it perfectly evenly, and it's not just at the equator. Because you have a sphere, you get higher and higher frequencies as you get near your poles. Okay. So it's a, it's a whole blending of frequencies. Like, for example, this is quite shocking, what I'll tell you now, is I'm the first one to do this. I took the capstone base of the Great Pyramid, 572.2 you know, primitive inches, which is almost the same as our inch. There's a difference of 1.00106 inches, so it's almost identical. And the way you calculate the electromagnetic frequency, which is speed of light of a standing oscillating wave around a a structure that has excited electrons in it. So the, the pyramid is made out of three different materials. The radioactive granite in the core, which is quite radioactive according to Robert Temple's measurements. And then it's surrounded by the two layers of limestone, which are all semiconductors, by the way, and which means they have electrons, unbound electrons on their surfaces. And the electrons get excited by the presence of fire or electricity. So there's two ways to excite the, the electrons in the Great Pyramid to cause it to generate frequencies. So what's shocking is the slope angle of the Great Pyramid is 51 degrees and 51 minutes. So if I take the square base of the capstone of the pyramid, which is 2288.8 um, um, primitive inches, so 572.2 times 4, and then I change it into modern inches, and then I resolve the speed of light in inches, and I calculate the frequency, it's 5151. It's 5.151 megahertz square. It's the same number as the slope angle, which means the builder knew the speed of light because we didn't know the speed of light even accurately in, until after 1972. So when Einstein was making a lot of his calculations, we didn't even have an accurate speed of light. The speed of light has to be so perfect in order for me to get the number that yeah, I got yeah, on the Great interesting. Pyramids. It is very Wait. interesting. I'll give you that. It, the builder knew the speed of light. Okay, we 5.151 have- megahertz square. So what does that frequency do? Why did the Egyptians make such a massive crystal oscillator and we make tiny ones? Yeah. Because... When you get at that many electrons in a massive semiconductor oscillating, you can you can open up a vortex wormhole, I believe. Well, that that's of reach yet. But uh, yeah. we've got two other sounds here, right? Mm-hmm. What are they? We have Vega. Um, can you see Vega? Sure. Vega was the star in the movie Contact. I love the sound of Vega. I mean, on my speakers, it, it's beautiful. All right. Let's see how they sound on... Everybody's speakers. This is this is going to be Vega. Huh. That actually is pretty cool. Um, so that's Vega. Uh, yeah, and I could scale it even better. I mean, if I had supercomputers, I could get more and more bands of resolution going up the sides of the sphere, and it would be even smoother sounding than that. All right, I'm going to do Vega again. I liked it. I kind of liked it. Vega, one more time. You could actually hear a little static in the middle of that. 
That was interesting. Yeah, that's probably just a little bit of. I don't hear that when I'm playing it here, but it's going through a huge network. You're, what's amazing is you're sending out the frequency of Vega through a huge network, and that frequency is hitting our whole planet right now, which is pretty amazing. And that's and, fine. And All does right. that open a line of communication between us and Vega? And that's what I found. Okay, well, that's what I don't get. And we'll come back to that because yeah. we have one more sound, right? We have one more sound. What is the name on that one? Spica. Spica. Spica, yeah. yes. Spica is in Virgo. Okay. Let's do that one and then we'll talk about it. Here it is, I think. <laughs> That one's a little annoying. <laughs> anyway, well, you know, if, when you, those radio astronomers, when they're listening to some of the pulsars and different sounds coming out of the stars, I mean, it's definitely enough to rattle your brain. When when I do this, I don't listen to the sounds. I induct my nervous system with a coil, so I don't hear anything because I magnetically transfer the frequency. All right, but here's what I don't get, David. Here's what I don't get. Mm-hmm. All right, I get how you came up the sounds, but you seem to be inferring that if you have this sound and you inductively couple it or whatever you do to get it into your body, and then Vega or whatever you're playing at that moment is is also, of course, emanating that sound, you seem to be implying that there's a communication. Well, see, that's how radio works. Whenever you have two distant frequencies that are identical from an oscillator, a crystal oscillator, you set up the communication and the transistors amplify that and then you hear it in the speakers. That's, but then you have to modulate the, you know, your voice or your music or your pictures onto the, the radio wave or the microwave. So that's how we do it today. But that's too slow. So what we're saying is that there's a faster component in the quantum, um, you know, function of the atom that sends the signal faster than light because those stars are too far away. Now you're only hearing a tiny part of the frequency of Vega. You're you're only hearing the part that your speakers can play. Okay. The, I'll the buy rest that. of the frequencies are on the file. And believe me, if tr- you can try this, you can take a signal generator and put two hertz into your speakers. And take the cover off your speakers, and you'll see the the, the speaker cone moving around. Yeah, so I know. A, a coil will transmit ultra low frequencies, even right. very low frequency. Right, I, I get all that. What I don't yeah. get is how those frequencies at point A and point B communicate with each other at faster than light. The if the frequency doesn't do it. The frequency sets up the the resonance of the two points because. That's how radio works. Any two points that are the same frequency set up the, free, the, the communication. The biophotons or the quantum function sends it to Pallades or Vega because that's it. the universe doesn't get mixed up. There's no other star with those exact frequencies because they're all different. This is how the universe created tuning. It created each star with a different sound, a different set of frequencies. And that's why you don't hear, like, remember the old days you got your cordless phone and you could hear your neighbor, you know, if they were too close. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that's because they didn't have enough separation in the frequency. So if there was another planet or star with the same frequency that you were tuning to, we would all be entangled together in that moment but the the universe didn't create planets and stars the same size in fact every star nasa measures they're never the same they're all different and when i scale them they all sound different because the numbers are all different and well if they relate to the size and mass then yes of course they're different they would have they're to all be. different yeah they would have and to. and that sets their own unique frequency apart from every single other star out there. Okay. Now, it's true that some can be incredibly close, close. like Sirius B and yes. Earth are almost the same. They're, they're not really, you know, in the world of radio, you would, you know, you if you were tuning down the radio band, you would skip over it. But in the old days with, you know, very low frequency radio, you get a lot of static, but you can hear the other side of the planet. Like, why could you hear... You know, I remember having one of those radios um, in, in Long Beach, Vancouver Island. I'm listening to a radio station in Japan. 
And that's because those long waves wrap around the sphere. Whereas the higher frequencies can't do that. They're, the wavelengths are too short. They won't go around the planet. So that's where it gets really, really amazing is that when, when I started doing this, or I, I was, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I wasn't like trying to point. All I did is I recorded, I took a recording of my wife, Crystal, singing this beautiful jazz song, um, Fly Me to the Moon by Frank Sinatra. And, and uh, I met my wife at the House of Blues with Dan Aykroyd and, and beautiful jazz singer. And I just thought, what a great song to send out to the Pleiades. So I did this a different way. I actually encoded her song into the ratio of all the stars. And I sent it out in this transmitter in Sedona, Arizona. And I sent it out and I said, well, that's probably going to be the end of that fun experiment. And in the middle of the night, I hear an audible voice, not my mind talking to itself, not an intuitive, you know, when you talk to yourself into intuitively. This was a, a very mellow male voice saying, congratulations, we received your message. Now what do you want to ask us? And I leaped out of bed. I was in that half in, half out state. I thought you were going to say it was Frank Sinatra from the other side. No, huh? It didn't sound like Frank Sinatra, and, and <laughs> that would have been nice. <laughs> And so what I did the next day is like, oh, my God, I'm going to record all these questions. Like, where have you been? How come you appeared to me as a kid in 1968 with a flying saucer? Why did you make that contact and then ignore me the rest of my life? I'm, I'm recording these in Pro Tools with a good microphone. Mm. And I send the questions out through the Palladian harmonics. And holy cow, it, it's like I, I, I opened up a paranormal wormhole in Sedona and it lasted a long okay, time. Okay, well, I, I can't confirm or deny, you know. There are certain yeah. aspects of what you say, David, that I understand. Uh, and then you make a leap that I don't understand. And see, I, we, I would, if, if I call you on the phone and I say, you know, um, I tell my buddy, you know, mow the lawn this way. You know, you go four times on the side and three times on the end. And then, you know, he does it wrong. And I said, well, that's what I said on the phone. and But you didn't hear me right. You see, when we say that you, the, the proof is that we, we believe that our telephones work is we hear each other. Mm. So in the end of the telephone, you need a consciousness to hear the phone call. And if there's no consciousness, did anybody really call you? And did they tell you to mow the lawn this way or that way? And that's where it gets interesting is because most of what the Palladians have told me, and I've had many, many experiences, including my little four-year-old daughter, don't even tell her what I'm doing. And she wakes up in the middle of the night and saying, Daddy, I saw a bright light coming and I, I jumped up and that's why I got scared in the middle of the night. Mm. I, I've seen so much proof that this works and this is how communications works. The next step to prove it to the world is you need that DNA transistor to amplify this ultra-weak signal that the brain is picking up. You see, the brain is is able to perceive in delta less than one hertz, less than one wave a second, right? But my point is the brain is sensitive enough to electrically pick up ultra-low frequencies, which are the wavelengths of big planets and stars, actually. But you can't tell me what the brain is picking up. You only know that the brain can measure a frequency that low but what if you have a dna transistor connected to that and then i can actually determine what consciousness a dna is. transistor a transistor that's connected to dna which is then connected to see you can connect an electrode to your brain yes and do an eeg but that's just yes. going to measure the frequency of the brain Remember, like radio works at, at different frequencies, right? You have okay, you've got me there and you're about to lose me. All right, because what do you mean by a DNA transistor? Well, you have to Google this. A DNA transistor means you would, you would take the transistor and you would connect it to tissue that is alive, that has DNA cells inside of it that are living to the, to the transistor. Now, you have to remember the very first transistor that John Bardeen and Will Bratton got working 
And there's three of them. I don't know why I'm blacking out the last guy, because there's three inventors of the transistor. It worked in water only, and water's full of DNA. It's full of little, you know, cells running around in there, and, unless you've got distilled water. So th- what I'm saying is that you, the, that's how you do it. You've got to amplify the tiny, tiny data and information that comes into the human brain that assembles itself as pictures in the mind. Yeah, but we're millions of miles from being able to do that. We're not. That's what I'm saying. Look up DNA transistors. They're, they're well, so Well, I mean, I, I think this. they are theoretical physicists are thinking about this stuff. But I, well, don't, I don't know of anybody who's actually done it. Talk to... Um, talk to... I'm trying to remember his name. He's, he's the solid-state physicist from Stanford, who was in the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? His his name, um, I don't know why. It's, it's All right, like, well, think about his name. I'll yeah. take a break here. All right, I can't resist doing this. I really, really, really liked the sun. So here it is one more time. All right. Anyway, uh, welcome back, uh, David. Uh, again, I'm going to try this one more time with you. I understand frequencies. I understand how you are deriving these frequencies, the measurements you're using to derive these frequencies. That makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense is if there is a frequency at Pallades and there's one here on Earth, um, how are you exceeding the speed of light to be in communication with, I'm, I'm guessing you're saying ETs, there, right? Exactly, yeah. But- okay, how do these two communicate with each other? How, how, at the, you know, greatly exceeding the speed of light, how does that happen? See, the, 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 the speed of light, the electromagnetic part of it, is not what's doing it. What it's is? actually the DNA. In fact, I just found this article, DNA Transistors, New Scientist, April 2nd, 2013. I just uh, I know they're talking you. about it. I, I am aware of that. Okay. So, like, here's one of the, you know, this is one of the ways I could explain it. And, and it's, there were studies done in Florida by, his da- name is David Cole, computer scientist, who connects human brain waves to EEGs and dolphins. Okay. And when the dolphins get near the humans, yes. the dolphins seem to cause the human brain wave to change to theirs. And the researchers don't seem to notice what's really going on here. And another study, separate study, they did this with children. And once again, the children's brain wave suddenly changed to the state of the dolphins. Now, what's interesting about this to me is the dolphin doesn't change to the human brain wave state. It's the human that changes to the dolphin's brainwave state. There actually are those who think dolphins could be conceivably smarter than humans. Uh, I'm sure you know that. Oh, well, tonally and frequency, they have a far greater frequency capacity than humans. Their their brains are nearly the size of ours, and they exhibit some of the same different frequencies of brainwave states that we do. But I believe, see, this is what happens with electrical inductance. If a a stronger magnetic field coil comes into proximity with a weaker magnetic field coil. Mm-hmm. The stronger one will usurp the weaker one and sure. transpose its magnetic field on the weaker one and increase its energy. Right. And there's two ways that happens. It's it's not just the field strength. It's the coherency and the organization of the dolphin brainwave that is much more peaceful and serene and organized. But the most important part of the experiment to me is what the subjects experience when they get in the presence of dolphins. You get children that are autistic that suddenly become coherent and start communicating. I've heard that. And that means that through living magnetic field inductance, Mm -hmm. you're transferring consciousness from one being to another. Okay, that I might be willing to buy, uh, actually. Uh, let's now, go. Uh, okay. Take a couple of calls, David. Yeah. Tulsa, Oklahoma. David Sarita. Hi, Art. Hi. Um, I- I'm just, uh, I- I'm still, th- tonight's guest, I'm, I'm a little confused. I feel like we're starting at A and then jumping all the way to Z, and I'm just sort of lost. And if you could go back over the deal with 
uh, DNA transistors because to me, I, we keep going back and forth between oscillators and transistors, and in my world, they're two different things. And you know, other than being a micro tiny switch attached to the you know recombinant chemical, I, I don't know what that would do. I mean, that doesn't to me seem like it would have any effect. And I'll take my answer off here. Okay. Well, well, first of all, transistors have multiple functions. In the early days, they were used to amplify radio signals because that's all we had as a means of communication. I mean, now transistors in your computer are used for colors and amplifying colors and, and generating colors and tones and everything in your computer. So you can't say a transistor is just an amplifier. It has right. unbelievable functions okay, and there's but, 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 billions of them in a single chip. Right, but he wanted you to connect it to DNA and I wasn't getting that either. Because okay, D- um, DNA this is how you would build an old magnetic field sensor. Is you would just wrap a copper coil <coughs> around a magnet and the magnet <coughs> and the coil would vibrate in the presence of a magnetic field and that's how you would detect the presence of radio waves or, or any type of frequency um and that's how you know we make sensors today. So your DNA is a coil. It, it is literally a coil. And Luc Montagnier proved, the, the winner of the AIDS uh, Nobel Prize who discovered the AIDS virus, that DNA reads very low frequencies because it's a sensor coil. Now, if you take the DNA and then you attach it to a series of transistors and amplify that tiny, tiny signal, I mean, it's so tiny, you eventually can see it in... A computer system. Okay, but as, what you're as, discussing now is off in the theoretical world. It has not yet been done. Well, when you look at some of the articles about, you know, like this one in New Scientist, DNA transistors pave the way for living computers. It, it's not, I mean, the direction I'm saying to use it is theoretical. Because <clears throat> what I'm saying is I'm having so many people doing this pulsing their body with inductance with these coils, right. the frequencies of distant stars and having experiences behind sleep and and even things happening in the house, <clears throat> that you would it would prompt you to say that there's got to be something going on here because it's not just me. There's hundreds of people having experiences like I'm talking about, remote viewing with frequencies, a distant planet or a distant star. So... I don't, I believe one of the greatest mistakes we've made in physics is that we have ignored what Einstein, Niels Bohr, and Max Planck have said about consciousness, is we just keep pretending, you know, the universe isn't conscious. But this is the funny part. When they're measuring the Big Bang and they're saying the first second, second second, they're acting like somebody's watching the universe banging. But if there's nobody around and you don't believe the universe is conscious, nothing's happening. Because there's nothing there to observe it. And and that's the funny part to me about physicists is when they say that there's no consciousness. What do you mean? You're a consciousness. You're looking at the experiment. If you're not looking at the experiment, it isn't happening. And they're saying there's no consciousness. And Max Planck was crazy and Einstein didn't really mean to say that. I mean, believe me, I've sat around and worked with some of the best Nobel Prize winners in the world on nuclear fusion and landmine and bomb detection. I know a lot about how electronic systems work and how they're developed. And I, I know these guys are, they tell me, I mean, these, these are current winners of prizes in physics that, that they were just being philosophical when Einstein said that about consciousness and that when Max mm. Planck said that. And I think that's where we've made the biggest mistake is we don't realize that the human nervous system is an electrical system. It can be inducted. Like in the case of an alien abduction, Your body becomes paralyzed by a field of energy that overtakes you. All right, we've got a break here. I think, David, we actually have somebody in a truck. Now, that's that's kind of unusual for this program. Uh, Brian, are you there? Yes, Art, can you hear me? I hear you. Are you really in a truck? You really are. (laughs) Yes, sir. Hey, uh before Art, I'm in Texas. This show is phenomenal. David's brilliant. I, I've I've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, I have my own hypothesis of uh, communication via quantum entanglement. Um, 
And I've been thinking for a long time about uh, global warming and how uh, radio frequency and the bombardment of radio frequency uh, in our atmosphere is affecting our climate and our polar shifts because of the heat and, and the magnetism of our radio frequency. So being able to cut down on our frequency pollution and communicate via quantum entanglement is key. Now, he was talking about uh, DNA transistors, which will eventually allow us to be able to create our first quantum computers. Now, that is one way to start, but I'm more of a, uh, uh, in the theory that we are capable of being able to communicate via quantum physics biologically. When he was speaking about Okay, well, uh, that actually, uh, you uh, are, uh, hold on, hold on, you're completely in sync with him. That's actually what he's talking about, is communication with alien beings through biological methods. Uh, I believe that is correct, right, David? Well, I'm using both. I'm, I'm taking the frequency of the star, uh, which most of it you can't hear because it's below the, the speaker and the human brain's ability. I transmit it from a sacred geometry coil under my bed into my body, and then... You know, when I don't do it, I don't have these experiences. And when I do do it, I have the experiences. So I know it works, and many of my users know it works. But the question is, how do you explain it, and how do you prove it? Not easily, and, and not easily. And part of what the caller is talking about, I, I believe a lot of the chaos in the electromagnetic transmissions around the planet are what's causing a lot of the heat. Because uh, yeah, chaos produces heat. Well, if radio waves could be seen, we'd all be ducking. Trust me, it would just be a soup out there. Denver, Absolutely. I mean, Denver, Colorado, you're on with David. Hey, Art. Love the show. Um, I'm uh, actually one of the people from the TuneIn app, so I got Joe Rogan to retweet that for <laughs> you to get you some more listeners. I love Joe. That's great. Because, Thank you. Um, yeah, my question for David was, um, after listening to him talk about the frequencies, um, I was wondering that if he could kind of help me out with a theory that I have, that maybe UFO crop circles are nothing more than the frequencies of David's circle talk from the whole night. Huh. Interesting. David? Well, see, that's just it. I started there. Like, I took the wavelengths of the crop circles, the real ones, and you can calculate those frequencies easily. It's just the speed of light divided by the distance around the circle and re and you got to use good resolution you can't just use feet you got to go right down to you know millimeters would be really good to get super accurate frequencies and look at the numbers and when you look at the numbers you go these are either harmonic numbers they're transmitting or non-harmonic numbers and that's a whole other part of my work that i discovered this music scale in the Great Pyramid that is far more harmonic than our modern music scale that we use today. And you can do this with distortion testing to prove it. So, I mean, there are examples of induction and consciousness everywhere, everywhere. There is, there's the case of the dolphins. There's in okay. William gets the David? crop circles, the quest for the truth. The yeah. little ball of white comes up to the guy in the tractor and he falls asleep. Right. You David, see it happen. It David, inducted his brain and put him into a trance. Right, got it. Can I ask you a question? When the pyramid <clears throat> yeah. was functioning, capstone on there and everything, and the pyramid was functioning, yep. what was it doing? I believe, and I've had this experience where I actually met Anubis in a in a lucid dream when I was pulsing pyramid frequencies in my body, yeah. and he told me, you know, with an oscillator that size, what it actually does is, see, we use oscillators to tune, to send two radio waves to communicate with each other, but it's not the frequency that's the communication. It's it's our voices and the, and the guy's horn who just played his horn. It went through, it vibrated, and it got encoded on the radio wave, and when it got here, we had disassembled okay. it and we played the sound back at instantly, right? So We use oscillators to establish the frequency that is then amplified and used for two-way communication, right? Two-way communication. But, but the frequency itself is not the communication. The communication is sound in pictures, which is, which is modulated onto the radio wave. So, but that only travels at the speed of light. Absolutely. The quantum function is faster. So what I'm saying is if you send the frequency of a distant star or planet yes. into a quantum uh, level vibration, then the quantum function will send the signal to that star faster than the speed of light. And that's how I believe the only way we're ever going to make ET contact is when we go in this direction. Well, you might be right about that. I, You know, I don't know... <laughs> 
uh, honestly, whether uh, we're ever going to make ET contact. But if we do, we're going to need something that goes really fast. And I think that's going to happen at the, the quantum level. So I, I, I agree with that. I just Well, we've already made ET. Uh, the point is, you know, we've made the contact. It's, it's happening to so many people, but they can't prove it. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Missouri. Hello, Missouri. Yes, uh, actually, it's Christy from Oregon. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and ask you guys your viewpoints on how frequency waves connecting with binaural beats, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, and sleep paralysis. Um, I've been practicing lucid dreaming for about six years now and, you know, meditating with the binaural beats. And I have found some uh, crazy reactions from it, that's for sure. I was just a little more curious about those frequency waves that we were hearing earlier and how they connect in and change our signals in our brain. You want that one, David? David? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Well, see, there's way beyond binaural beats. I mean, I found, like, the pyramid is a quadrineural transmitter. In fact, when I transmit the four uneven wavelengths of the Great Pyramid sides all the way up, I get this incredible breathing, rising, and falling energy wave. And the brain seems to really, really love it. It really seems to relax and energize the entire body. So, Can you record that one for us? I, I'll send it to you. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, it, actually, it. the sounds would blow yeah, you away. Awesome. If you have really good, I use ESS speakers and I can shake the whole house. We've got pretty things. good audio, so we'll shake them up. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send you those. Okay. But the point is over and over and over again. I mean, the caller just asked about sleep paralysis. Yes. When, when a, a being or a consciousness with a greater magnetic field than your nervous system, which is not very powerful, the human nervous system, usurps it, you become paralyzed because there's far more energy coming from their magnetic field than yours. And therefore, they can transfer either a negative or a positive experience to you through that taking over your electrical nervous system. But they wouldn't permanently take over your system. Like there's a story of of Robert Monroe in Claude Swanson's book, The Synchronized Universe, where Robert Monroe is sleeping in this cage with all these wires wrapped around the sleeping area, right? And he goes out of body, goes through the wires, and then they put certain frequencies in the wires and he can't get out of body. He's trapped, and like that's what pulling, happens with disharmonic. Hold on, David. Hold on. A caller? Yeah. Caller? Go ahead. I'm so sorry for interrupting. No, I go had ahead. ones where I was out of body, body experiences where I was pulling. I could feel literally like my soul or whatever you may call it pulling from my head and my body. And I could feel my physical body shaking, but I, I couldn't get out of it. But I was trying so hard to. Once I got out, I uh, actually floated, of course, to my ceiling, which I hear is very common. And I could see my surroundings below me. Uh, when I woke up, I found that my surroundings were exactly how I uh, envisioned them in my dream. But I, I meditated with these beats before most of my dreams that I had like this. But I was wondering if the pole is like that. I mean, is the pole where you're like, it almost feels real from pulling from your head, your body. Well, see that you described the intense vibrations when you were going out. And that's when the electrical nervous system starts getting pulsed and it, so it feels like a pulsing because there's a okay. lot of energy moving through the spine and the nervous system and then eventually you have enough energy and the right frequency to get out but there, what I'm saying in the Monroe experiment is there are certain frequencies that will trap you and keep you stuck here and there's other frequencies that can liberate you and get you out there and mm-hmm. I found when what really binds us to this body? We can't get out. We can't get past the solar system or we can't even get past Earth because we're all dreaming at the same frequency as our own planet. So how do you get past it? How do you get out there? And it's simple. The same way you change a radio station. You just got to use a different mantra is what they would call it in, in India, in ancient India in the Vedas, a different sound that would tune you or a different drum beat in a native you know, American or, or First Nations circle, and the timing of that drum beat would be the timing of the wavelength of a distant star. And that's how you would do it. But, see, I eventually think this is going to get to the point where these these biotransistors, these DNA transistors, will be able to amplify this signal, the very weak signal that goes through the nervous system that may appear as a voice. You may hear a voice or you may have a vision. 
but you'll eventually be able to amplify those ultra weak um, signals, and you'll be able to hear them just like uh, EVP and and uh, reverse speech. You know, are all that stuff that was was coming out years ago that you were having on your show. I mean, that's the beginning of consciousness interfacing with technology. We're about to do an EVP show. Uh, all right, very quickly, Nick on Skype. Hey, uh, I just was wondering, uh, I'm trying not to panic here, uh, what David was saying about dolphins. Mm-hmm. Uh, could he expand a little more on the whole communication well, what, what with was, dolphins? What was panicking you? Uh, well, I just don't want to panic hearing aliens and dolphins, um, making sure I have my towel. Your towel? Yeah. I'm, I'm not following, I'm sorry. Um. Sorry. Break, breaking down I, I into tears. Don't, don't panic. <laughs> well, yeah. The, what, I, what I'm saying about dolphins is that they're tonally far more advanced than us. I mean, they can sing and tone far higher frequency than humans. I mean, right. beyond 100,000 hertz and also very, very low frequencies. But so we don't really have a lot of range. I mean, I have this online no, we, course we where I teach don't. people how to tone all these these tones from the Great Pyramid Scale and expand their their brainwave range and their consciousness range. But dolphins clearly exhibit a far greater, far more harmonized magnetic field than humans. And what I'm saying in these studies is <clears throat> with children and even autistic children is the dolphins clearly exhibit a more superior, more desirable, peaceful brainwave state, and they can transpose it onto a human so they can experience it. And that's a form of biological... I guess it is. ...magnetic field abduction. And and it's a a kind abduction. And then there are certain abductions that are involuntary abductions that are are not desirable. Okay. Austin, Texas, uh, your turn with David Sarita. Hello. Hey. Hey, Art. Hey, David. Uh, I, I was checking out David's uh, a website, and he has a course that he's offering. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what's the what's the average time of contact once you uh, take your course? Uh, <clears throat> what do you mean the average time of, of contact? It's and do you uh, mean? I mean, what's the average time before you make contact with uh, any entity? Well, theory? it would be different with every person. See, I believe the 60 hertz wiring around your house and the Wi-Fi and the cell phone and all of the satellites transmitting are bombarding your nervous system and programming you. So to get you out of the program, you, first you've got to retune the nervous system with these very sacred tones that I found in the Great Pyramid Scale. And then once you're a well-tuned nervous system, then you can start tuning. Actually, you can actually get the exact frequency of different moons, of different planets inside the solar system. I've had a lot of luck remote viewing the, the planets in our own solar system as well as distant stars. But I found first you've got to be nicely tuned before it's easy to go out of body or remote view very distant. Okay, planets. well, so his question was, if he were to proceed with your course as outlined i guess on the website how long before you could conceivably make contact i think the longest it's taken somebody to have an experience is around a month um of doing it every day but the course doesn't focus on contact in the first year it focuses on tuning and harmonizing your nervous system to produce a very desirable state of consciousness I had some kind of a contact, uh, or OBE, sleeping underneath a pyramid with a crystal on top, and that was back in 98. And, uh, of course, there was no communication, but there was this extreme love coming from this entity looking at me. And he was sitting on a horse, of all things, and the, ho- and the horse would look like it appeared to be on a, a starship, <laughs> which is a weird... Horse on a oh, starship. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, it sounds like a fantastic a, experience to me. That, but only, uh, that was the only time I've ever had that experience in my lifetime. That was back in 98. And that was without DMT, right? Yes, that's, <laughs> that's true, Art. Uh, one other thing, I, I, I did use your, your jewelry once, and, and I still have this weird effect. <laughs> my, think, my jewelry? Uh, not your jewelry, David's jewelry. David, um, okay. Um, uh, whether it was taken away, uh, it was mysteriously taken away from me. But the effects is I project energy out of my eyes. Uh, in other words, your picture on Art's website there, you you, you got that weird look. You know, it's kind of <laughs> intense. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I have that look in my eyes, and 
uh, people are almost sometimes either react good to it or they freak out at it. <laughs> and I, I could, I project energy that actually zaps them. Um, and I don't know what to think of it or what to make of it anymore. You know, it, it, it I almost feel like Sasquatch, like I'm Sasquatch and people are looking at me and spotted something crazy and then they could be hundreds of feet away from me. Sometimes I could lock them up with my energy and I don't, I don't know what's right, going listen, on. We are woefully <laughs> out of time. I'm terribly sorry. And then somebody's distracting me by calling me on Skype with a name, Skype name of beating a pale horse. David, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Um, but we are absolutely out of time. So, out of time. Yes. Uh, so, Thank you, Art. It's been wonderful being here. It's a real treat for me to hear your voice again. And I love your skepticism and, and how deep you go on both sides of the question. Well, I, I try to understand. Sometimes I get stuck, David. And, um, it's I, great. It's great. I love it. Okay. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Take care. That's it. This magical journey. It goes on. We'll take us on a ride Every night, five nights a week It's called Midnight in the Desert Thank you all and have a week Worldwide, through all the time zones Have a great night, see you tomorrow Will the sun shine on you Midnight in the desert